All right, so today's big idea, we're going to cover Facebook. So I'm going to write the notes as usual. I'll put them into the network folder, and I'll remind you where the network folder is a little later if you need it. And once again, I'm recording these lectures. If you'd like access to them, you can email me. My email's in the syllabus. I'll remind you where the, the syllabus is in a moment. If you've requested the emails before, I probably replied to you and gave you the link. If I haven't, I apologize. I get a lot of emails. I'll get to yours very soon. And once you get the link, you can just follow that one link every time and the videos will be there. Uh, so today will be Facebook Two billion users and going strong, uh, question mark. So um, Facebook uh, has been around since 2004. And um, it started off as a uh, social network for only Harvard students. Did anyone ever see the movie The Social Network? That one sort of like a, a fictional, not fictional uh, origin of Facebook. Um, it was started in Harvard, then it expanded to have access to other colleges and universities, and then the general public, and then advertisers and companies and marketers and such. So right now, it's at uh, at least or over 2 billion users, which includes people and companies. So why use Facebook for your business? You can say because everyone is on it. Now, whenever I do these classes, and I've been doing this uh, social media class and various other classes um, for at least five years at this college, and I've seen it, all the networks, how they grow, how they, how they change, how they improve, how they stumble. And um, I remember years ago when it was the big deal that, wow, Facebook has reached 500 million users. Well, you know, four, it's four times bigger than that in a short amount of time. And Facebook has been the, the is, it's now the 800 pound gorilla. It's where it, where, where it goes, everyone follows for good and for bad. And I will say early on, Facebook is a double edged sword in terms of, you know, we've got pros and cons, like I said about um, reach is tremendous. People uh, create accounts, they use these social networks, they use Facebook, they share, what am I having for lunch today? Where am I visiting today? I'm on vacation, here's a picture of me. I really like that concert. People are putting a lot of information about themselves on all of the networks, not just Facebook, and uh, therefore um, a con could be intrusive. And we've been hearing recently congressional hearings, news reports about uh, did social media, did Twitter, did Facebook, did all of them have some sort of uh, sway negatively, positively, too far in our last election cycle? Uh, is it eroding our ability to communicate in the real world? Is it altering children's brains to be looking at these screens all day long? You know, there's all of this negativity and positivity, both sides of it, of social media. And I, I don't think it's very valuable for us to go into the negatives of these networks. You're here because you want to use these networks to uh, improve your business. So I, I focus on the positives of it, and the big uh, idea of it is that the reach, you can reach the right people, very targeted. Uh, I've said before about uh, a billboard. I put a billboard on, on Main Street, and I get the traffic that looks at it, and then some people might follow through with that billboard and go to my restaurant. But I'm not reaching enough people on Main Street. I put the billboard on 2nd Avenue, and I put it on Lane Street. And I put it on a variety of places, but it still depends on people passing by that billboard to see that my business exists. Social media, I can put the billboard in people's faces a lot more directly uh, to the right people, the people that are interested in a restaurant. I want to try a new Italian food restaurant tonight. 
I'm tired of the same one I go to. Well, I'm tweeting about that or I'm posting about that on Facebook and such, and me as that business then has access to that, and I would know who is interested in Italian food restaurants, who is coming from out of town visiting San Diego, and I want to let them know my business exists. Its reach is uh, tremendous. We'll see how it works. Um, exactly of course and um, another con would be uh, could be expensive all social networks are free to set up and use but you often get the best results when you pay to use them as a business as a person, the regular average person doesn't have any need uh, to pay for any of the services that these networks offer. They just use it, share their pictures of breakfast, share their funny cat pictures, just use it as normal. But for us as a business, it will behoove us uh, to invest some amount of money into Facebook or Twitter or Pinterest or LinkedIn or whatever network we talk about. They all have an aspect of this. It would behoove us uh, to pay a little to reach a little more. The same in the real world about that billboard is not free, that radio ad is not free, those flyers that you're putting on people's wind, uh, windshields are not free, uh, the person flipping the sign on the corner uh, is not free, hopefully you're paying them at least minimum wage. Uh, so social media itself also for us as businesses or marketers uh, is not free but it can be uh, very affordable. So, before we get into the, the, the weeds in another social network, uh, I want to touch on um, the, the concept of style guides and such. So, let's do this. Let's go ahead and open up your, uh, your web browser. Pick any web browser you like and let's go online. Uh, let's go to a search engine. So Google, Yahoo, Bing, whatever you'd like. I'll go with Bing today. So just go to any search engine. I'm going to go to Bing.com. I'm going to search. And uh, the idea is I'm going to search for social media style guide examples. See right here, I'm going to put myself out of a job. What we're talking about in these classes you can, of course, look up and find more about. But I want to show you that with any of these search engines, you'll, you'll be able to find more information about the things that we cover. Because in theory, I could spend a whole month on one social network. I could uh, teach uh, you know, Facebook four weeks in a row. I could cover YouTube four weeks in a row. I could cover all of these networks completely non-stop for the whole month. I want to do an overview of all of the networks, all of the important ones, to give you a sense of which is the one that I get, which is the one where my clients are, which is the one that I like to use. So we do an overview. Therefore, when you want to find more information on any of the things that I talk about, if I, if I don't get back to go deeper on a topic, you can always search to find more. Now let's see what kind of results I get here. I haven't checked these yet today, so let's see what comes up. First, there's a definition. A social media style guide is the go-to source for how your brand appears and acts on social media. It allows your brand to create a cohesive experience across every profile. Your guide includes brand colors, voice, visual guidelines, and everything else that dis distinguishes your brand on social media. That's a, a style guide, which also applies in real world. Coca-Cola has a style guide. Our college has a style guide. It's uh, what, what defines our voice, our, our look, how we act, our business on social media. So I'm just going to copy this and put it into the notes. You might have found different results, and that's fine. You probably also find, found a good answer. So my definition here. A document, so you can create a Word document or anything you'd like. A document that lays out the who, what, when, where, why, and how of your business. 
how it communicates, why it's in business, etc. So answering all of these questions here, as well as the logo of your business, how it will look online and print, the colors, uh, formulas of your business. What color is this right here? Is it right here? Some sort of green, exactly. It's a green color, but there's a specific formula that defines this green. Uh, is this green the same as this green? No. no, they're both green, but they're not the same green. That's the thing about the style guide. This blue that was chosen for our catalog, blues, is are a very specific uh, formulas of colors that then we use in print and on the website and in a business card and on TV and on YouTube so that it's all consistent. So that's part of the style guide, defining the colors of your, of your brand and using them consistently. That uh, the famous Coca-Cola red or the McDonald's yellow, that's a very specific formula mixture and it must be used all the time or else it looks like a knockoff. It looks like an imitator. Um, all of that kind of stuff goes in the style guide. It could be a living document in terms of it changing. It is something that you're going to base yourself on of everything that you do, but it could change. Big companies do that all the time. Uh, you know, do you remember the, throughout the years, the logo for Pepsi? It had a certain style in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s and the 2010s. It does change for every generation, but it's still been the same colors, that same red, white, and blue, just in different ways. So your style guide shouldn't be a straight jacket completely in terms of that it doesn't uh, change with the times or your audience. It could change as needed. I'm going to go further here and perhaps look at some more detailed examples. We've got the New York University Social Media Style Guide. So NYU apparently here has their style guide up there online. I haven't looked at it. I'm going to take a quick look at it. See, this is eight pages long. And let's see how it goes. Who created it? 2014. Style guide purpose. Purpose of this um, guidelines for NYU's central social media accounts. Document is updated frequently. So they've got a list of what these are our active accounts. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, Google Plus. Uh, our voice who we are. They're portraying themselves as fun, witty, engaged. However you define that, open to interpretation. How are you going to create a fun tweet? How are you going to create a witty Facebook post? How are you going to create an engaging Instagram uh, photo? It's very useful how they've got it here. Keyword and then spelling out a little bit more. We don't know what it means to quit. So again, a lot of what social media is, it ties so much together into marketing. Into marketing. And, and, and marketing, a lot about is about convincing you of something. If you really, really break it down, uh, a lot of marketing is a, designed to make you feel bad. Oh, uh, you don't look how you want, here's our product. Uh, you don't smell how you want, here's our product. Uh, you don't... Um, uh, you're not as smart as you'd like to be, here's our product. So they're trying to, marketing and advertising is often trying to convince you of something. With phrasing like this, we don't know what it means to quit, they're convincing you. Uh, we're engaged, uh, you know, enroll here, you will be uh, a go-getter as well. And it's all 
spelled out here uh, our tone. We are energetic and enthusiastic. We believe in what we do. We accept we made a mistake. Let's see, all messages on our meter are posted in the character voice described above. We do not attach names. Okay, so this is showing here. We have like seven people running our Twitter account, but we're all one voice of the university. We don't uh, attribute each other uh, individually. We have transparency. Let's see, when possible, reference the account mid-message as opposed to at the end. So not great. Uh, they said, OK, we want to mention the, the university, but not, um, not at the end. We want it a little bit more towards uh, the middle of the post. I'm going to put this into uh, the network folder as an example. We'll find plenty of them out there, but I'm glad I found this one too. Even little things like this. Use a colon and a space before a link. So visually that helps differentiate it. And oftentimes with word wrap, when things are in different sizes, you know, things jump from different lines to different lines. So with a colon and a space, perhaps the link is often on its own lines what stands out. And uh, again, you can look at that on your own. Use a single exclamation point, a single excitement, which is, of course, grammatically correct. You don't need seven exclamation points to get the word across. You're not 12 years old. So one exclamation point. In very rare instances, multiple exclamation points may be used, but think judiciously about whether the situation warrants more than one. M dashes. OK, they want to use M dashes, not the plain old dash hyphen. You know, the, the plain hyphen is right on your keyboard, but the M dash is a special command. Specifically on Twitter, do this. Specifically on Facebook, Google Plus, do that. Instagram, to be filled in by Psy. Psy hasn't done their job yet, so that's not uh, filled in yet. Cadence, six to nine posts daily on Twitter. So obviously they've got a team of people working on that. And that sounds like a lot, but this, this could be like, well, today we're having meatloaf in the cafeteria. You know, posts don't have to be epic every single time you, you, you post something. It's, remember what I said, we've got posts that are um, promotional and posts that are community building. Uh, m remarking what we, what's in the cafeteria today is community building. It's perhaps not really you know, selling yourself, come to NYU, you're going to get meatloaf. No, it's about the people that are already there and building community. We're all a part of it. I had the meatloaf too, and it wasn't great. So Instagram, two posts per week. Facebook, three to four daily. YouTube varies. Yeah. Why is there a difference between the number of posts for Twitter and Facebook and Instagram? We have to ask the people that run NYU account. Okay. Um, they might perhaps feel that in, uh, Twitter is more immediate than Facebook, even though everyone is on Facebook. Uh, studies are showing that younger people are not as interested in Facebook as they used to be. I'm just curious because it's like multiple daily for Twitter and Facebook, but Instagram's like just go for what we can get. Yeah, that one is a little uh, odd as well there, in because Instagram seems to be the one where it's growing with younger people. So this. I saw the date at the top that said 2014. I haven't seen a last updated, but I, it said 2014. So maybe in 2014, it wasn't as big of a concern. So this might not be the latest version of the guide. And uh, imagery, all avatars should align with the visual identity style guide. So here's another style guide that they have. It'd be nice if they had the link on that. But they've got another style guide that talks just about the images. I bet it's stuff like make sure the images are desaturated 10%. Uh, make sure that every person that is photographed is facing to the left. You know, that's probably some sort of guide that further defines it. Cover image should be the same across all platforms. So like on Twitter, you've got a spot at the top to put a nice big wide graphic, the cover graphic. It should be the same one on their Instagram, on their Facebook, etc. Images should be on Instagram. Images should be artsy, but not unnatural, which is a subjective, of course. Effects should never compromise image quality. So 
So they must have a document elsewhere that further defines this. They've got, they seem to have these personas, the beehive, the friend. Let me make a note of that. I'll come back to personas in a moment. What else? Regularly use hashtags. So on Twitter, use these ones. Hashtag NYU, hashtag NYU 2018 for the incoming year for a graduate. Uh, hashtag TBT. What does TBT stand for again? Uh, Throwback Thursday. Facebook, Instagram, Google+. Plus. And there it is. So I'm going to save this into the network folder if you just want an example of it. Um, creating something like that I think would be useful for, for most of you. It doesn't have to be as detailed. But I think it does a very good job of, of um, being a good example of what a style guide could be. And when you searched, you might find examples from elsewhere. Maybe you can even search Coca-Cola style guide or Nike style guide. And they might have a copy of it online. And you see how those big companies do it. They could be trade secrets, though, and it, they could be posted uh, online without permission. But if you find one of those, I won't tell on you. OK, so could be as detailed or general as you want. inspiration from other style guides online and try to focus on another in your niche. I found the style guide for New York University but I'm a pizza parlor. It might not correlate as well if I borrow their ideas of that style guide for my business. So perhaps I could try to find the style guide for Pizza Hut, or Domino's, or New York Giant Pizza, or something. And something a little bit more in my niche might help me uh, create my own style guide. So any questions on, on the concept of the style guide, or, or this one that I pulled up, or any questions on this at the moment? All right. So. I mentioned just a moment here, personas. This is another marketing term, post personas. Let's look up an example, see how it comes together. So again, I'll, I'll do a search, go to any search engine, and I'm going to look up um, social media personas, examples. So I don't get a nice definition in this example of results, but as I scroll down, I see um, two links that I like that I will look at. In my case, I got a result from Hootsuite.com and BufferApp.com. Uh, I'm going to put these in the notes for a moment, and then I'll come back to them. Sweet and buffer. I'll come back to those two websites in a moment. But I want to see one of these examples. Maybe this one, the beginner's guide to creating marketing personas at Buffer. So going here, the complete actionable guide to marketing personas, their definition. I'm writing this post to Dan, Mary, Stephen, and Rachel, one of whom is likely you. You see these people are personas, created with a combination of raw data and educated guesses, <coughs> representing slices of this blog's readership. Um, Dan could be you, Mary could be your coworker. What these sketches provide is a touchstone for creating content. 
when I can put a name and a background to the people reading what I write, I can hopefully meet their needs even better. So a definition here, personas. Fictional people that you um, write to. Meaning, uh, who are the people you're trying to communicate with in social media? Who is on the other side of Twitter? Who is that on Facebook you're trying to sell to? Fictional people. Um, I'll look at the article further in a moment, but the idea is, uh, in terms of marketing, uh, let's say um, we've got in the real world we've got these uh, beverages. We've got Coca-Cola, uh, we've got Powerade, and, and we've got Dasani water. All three of them have a specific uh, target audience, right? Uh, people that want Coca-Cola. Uh, want it for for whatever the reason, uh, the flavor of it, the nostalgia of it, whatever. I'm thirsty. I, I want a Coke. People that want Powerade often would want it well, after a workout. I, I need it to have a good workout and, and recover. People that want water, well, I, I just want plain old water. I, I like it. I want water. So all three of those people are completely different demographics. They want that product for their reason. Now, all, I, all those three products come from the same company, the Coca-Cola parent company. But they have to market each one of those three beverages to three different people for three different purposes. Someone that wants the water doesn't want the Coke. Someone that wants the Coke doesn't want the Powerade. Uh, so they have to know who are they marketing to. So a company like Coca-Cola then has to figure out who are we marketing to by using either their 100 years of data or for us, educated guesses about, well, I'm trying to sell pizza and it's kind of like artisanal, handcrafted, sort of old world style pizza. So I want to reach hipsters, I guess. Um, not people that are looking for cheap pizza, but people that know that a good slice of pizza, yeah, it'll cost $7 because it's got the best stuff on it. So um, personas. These help you create a message on social media because you put a face to the pixels. The dots on the screen, the pixels, we forget that on the other side of this is a potential customer. And so if we invent a person who we're trying to reach, we'll have more success because we're trying um, to reach the right person. So let's see here further the basics. Your marketing persona is a composite sketch of a key segment of your audience. Um, let's see, okay, so it can be as detailed as you need it to be, and here the, the template is, uh, what's the person's name, job title, where do they work? Details about their role, what are the demographics, education, their values, and such. So yeah, this is also another bit of extra work. When Daniel was here talking about the Fleet Center, the Science Center, and um, the concept of, of STEM, and they're trying to reach uh, people interested in science, technology, education, and mathematics, um, they they are trying to reach people that are interested in those things, of course. They're trying to go... They, he came here to a, 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 a college, an educational institute, to talk about, I'm part of an educational institute where I'm trying to reach an audience. So he came here, and a few of you seem to be interested, so he, he reached the right people. If he had gone to, you know, across the street to the hotel over there and talked to a dentist convention, uh, they probably wouldn't be really interested in what he had to say, but he came to the right place. Uh, a persona helps you in that, in that you figure out who am I trying to reach in my social media.
So this is a very good article. I'm going to put it into the notes as well. You can further go into it. And then they do their step-by-step -step filling it out. So this probably is just a stock photo they borrowed from Google. But then they um, put, they filled in these details. And once you kind of have someone that you're trying to market to, you could be more successful because then it's, it's not so abstract. So I'll put it into the notes. <coughs> so it's a long article, but it's very detailed. I, I, I think you should really look at it. And um, there seems to be also a good amount of comments at the end. Uh, I think comments can be useful on some of these professional articles and such because then other people give more uh, insight and their own opinion and, and links and further info. Okay, so any questions on the concept of personas or this article and such? Okay, uh, I said, I mentioned um, Hootsuite, if you want to go over to Hootsuite.com. This is going to be part of two things that I want to mention at the moment. And the other is Buffer.com. So we've talked about two social networks so far, and today we're going to cover a third one, and we'll cover more as the course goes on. Um, and uh, I think it, it, it might have already been asked, but it always, get, always gets asked, how do I manage all of these at once? There's too many of them. I have too many logins. I have to remember to log in here. I forgot to post there. Too many things to manage. Hootsuite and Buffer try to solve that issue in that you can link all of your accounts into one dashboard, into one login, and then post into Twitter and into Facebook and into Instagram and such all at the same time. Um, I've used both personally. I like Buffer a little better. And like most services online, there is a free version and a paid version. The paid version gives you much, many more features, but the free version often has a lot of great beginning features that can take you pretty far. So if you browse Hootsuite for a little bit, it'll tell you, you can manage all your media in one place here. Start your 30 day, your free 30 day trial. And these big companies also use it. Uh, save time by scheduling. So here from the screenshot, they're creating some posts and they're going to automatically come out every Monday. So we saw the New York University style guide that you have to be tweeting like three times every day. Well, they could schedule themselves that next week uh, this will automatically come out on a Tuesday. So here we've got that. And then you check your stats about what was effective and what wasn't. Buffer.com is similar to that. It's just another company doing the same thing. You can connect your Pinterest and your Google Plus and LinkedIn, etc., into one place and manage it all at once. So of the two, I would recommend perhaps look into Buffer first because you've got the starter plan for zero dollars a month. You get the uh, access of three social accounts. Uh, the ones to choose from are these right here. So you can have three of those for free. You probably then would choose Facebook and uh, Instagram and, and Twitter, depending on your business, of course. 
well, I also need to get on Pinterest. Well, that's the next one. And I also need to manage 150 of them at once. So I go to that one. But with the free one, uh, I think it's going to be very good. Even if you're limited to only three networks, you can pick the three ones most important to your business. You can schedule 10 can schedule 10 posts in advance. When you go up to the higher levels, you get more scheduling. And all of these others are pretty, this, pretty much the same. So it doesn't look like you get very good statistics to show you your, your results in Buffer. But within the networks, the networks themselves give you stats about how well you're doing in the network. But here in the aggregator, it seems that for the free one, uh, you don't get very good stats. You go up to the next level, $15 a month. So yeah, it can get very expensive. But the big companies, yeah, $400 a month, no problem. We need to spend on this to be able to manage all of our networks and to put our message out and to reach more customers. So these are the two big ones, Hootsuite and Buffer. Uh, has anyone heard of any other ones, perhaps, that are something like this, managing multiple social media at once? There used to be one called Bottlenose. I don't think it's around anymore. Let's see, Bottlenose Social Media. Is it still around? Bottlenose, yeah, this is it. Looks like they've kind of evolved a little bit more. Products. So uh, Buffer and uh, Hootsuite, those are the two I would recommend. We'll take a break in a moment, but I also want to note, OK, I don't want to pay for any of these platforms, but Hootsuite and Buffer both have really great social media blogs to help you keep up to date uh, with social media concepts and a lot of how-tos. That's all for free. So I'm going to put the links to their blogs in the links in the notes here as well. So Hootsuite and Buffer, two um, websites that help you manage all your social media at once. Various plans exist. The free one is pretty good. Or read their free blogs for tips and tricks. Blog.hootsuite.com. blog.bufferapp.com How the Instagram algorithm works in 2018. Everything you need to know. Six shortcuts to speed up your social media scheduling process. How to use Pinterest, the insider guide for businesses. Uh, don't read that before coming to this class. Uh, I don't want to be out of a job. All right, so uh, I wanted to give you those resources, those various concepts. I'm going to put these notes in the network folder later, but I wanted to cover uh, style guide personas a bit and some of these websites. We're going to take a break in a moment, and when we come back, we will start to use Facebook more hands-on. So any questions so far? Okay, it's 10:30. Let's take a break until 10:40, and then when we go on, and when we come back, we'll go on.